Yes, sir. <laughs> check, 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 check. Can you hear yourself? Check, so, check. You can slide up to it, man. Yeah. There we go, right? Yeah. There, good money. Coffee over here. Yeah, I can see an epic fail going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that joint. Everything over oh. with. I bet, man. Shit, we live, bro. We can do the business, man. How are you? I'm great, man. Glad Yo, to be here. You want to be called Kenneth or Kenny? I go by Kenny. Kenny? Yeah. I bet, bro. I just want to make sure I get the names correct and everything. Absolutely. But, I appreciate you coming to the pod. This joint is simple, man. I go through like Three, four little questions, man, and then we branch off little ones. You know, any part of your story you want to share, because that's what it's all about for me is, you know what I'm saying, getting these stories out to people who need to hear them. Bet. You feel me? That's in the struggle. So mm. I'm going to play my little little intro track, All right. and then we'll get rocking. Mm. Y'all know the vibes. We back again. That's right. Hey, what's going on? This is Jerry. It's the Redeem Yourself Podcast. This is I need to update this, this joint. I keep saying that. The we'll make it happen one day. <laughs> That's it. Redeem so Yourself about. Podcast. That's Hell nice. yeah, man. That's the way I like to start the party. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Let's do a quick check in, my guy. How are you? I man. know it's Monday, man. You know, the week ain't really got started, but you. Man, my week got started last week. It feels <laughs> like I just brought home a oh, brand yeah. new baby, man. Oh, like, congratulations, brother. Congratulations. Blessings on blessings on blessings coming into my life, man. You know, when my journey began, these are things that I prayed for every single day. And like they're coming and falling in my lap daily, weekly, monthly, and like. I'm just smiling on the way, man. Hey, man, it's a blessing how those things just start to form when we start living right. Just doing the next right yeah, thing, Yeah, the next right thing, yeah. man. <laughs> just doing the next right uh, thing brings it all the time, It man. is crazy how simple it really is when you break it down, man. Well, like yeah, that's dope. I like yeah. that. Simplistically complicated. Yeah. That's fire. Man, but that's congratulations to you, sir. Yeah, man. The joy. thank you, thank you. I was begging my wife for another one for a while. She she kept turning me down, and then we babysat <laughs> one of our friends. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think the baby might be like one or two now. After I set up all night, I was like, yo, babe, I don't oh, <laughs> Forget all that. Nah, I mean, I ain't trying to go back. You know, <laughs> she was like, really? I was like, yeah, no. Nah, congratulations to man, you, I sir. Appreciate it. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. It's a boy. Oh, Samson man. Knox. That's what's up. Yeah. When when he when he get to running, man, bring him on out to the football field. Too. Absolutely. I got <laughs> I got a two year old that's ready to go now. Word. Bring yeah. him on out there, man. Flag football starts. I think I had my son playing flag at three. Okay. Just just to get him like oriented to the yeah, thing. man. Yeah. You know, want nothing too crazy, but you know he. They usually playing in the dirt. Right yeah, there, that's you know? it, man. Yeah. Put him to go. Yo, take the ball and run. You no know doubt. what I'm saying? Yeah. But yeah, man, quick check in for me. You know, it's it's Monday today, like I said, but you know, I, I feel pretty good, man. I'm blessed to be here. Yeah. You know, grateful that we able to connect, uh, get this taken care of, get this story out. And uh yeah, man, I'm just looking forward to hearing what you got to say, bro. That's what's up, man. That's a bet. I'm glad to be here. No doubt, no doubt. So man, it's it's simple. The first question I ask everybody, you know, is is how is life for you growing up? You know, take me back to as far as you can remember, man, is we going to take this joint from childhood, you know, through youth, through young adult, mm -hmm. and, you know, all the addiction that come with it, and then towards the U-turn moment at the end. All right. And then, you know, I'll pause you and ask, like, questions in between, elaborate and such. So. All right, sir. Yeah, man. Childhood. Let, let's see. I, I can't say that I ain't have a wonderful and blessed childhood. Like, I had a mother that would do absolutely anything for us. I had a brother. Me and him really didn't get along, mm -hmm. right? And older brother, younger brother, older brother, and like now we're we're wonderful. Like we love each other and, and thank the world of one another. But like he had his struggles, and my mom kind of tended to his because his were a little bit more than mine mm -hmm. when we were younger. So I grew up around my aunt a lot, which like totally took care of me, blessed me, mm -hmm. was there for me, and everything. And it was a lot of the instant gratification 
okay. that young, okay. you know what I mean? Yeah, that yeah. I that I recognize that I, that I brought in, but like, so you were spoiled. Yeah, yeah, for, <laughs> for sure. Like my aunt definitely tried to make up for you know mom doing her thing with my brother, and I got used to it. But I can't like any new Jordan that came out. You know, it's been a it's been a childhood thing when to dress up and, and and be those things. You know, but like. It was a struggle too. Like I, mm. I, I had a, I had a, I wanted to be there with my mom. I wanted to be there with my brother. Um, and I, I remember those feelings. I'm like, why, why can't I be there? You know what I mean? Why can't I be the one looked out for? Why can't these mm. things, these questions as a kid? You know what I mean? That you just don't really realize are going through your head until you start to get older and mature, and, and you see those things. Uh, and I think my family was trying to block me from them mm-hmm. necessarily to like give me this aspect of like, it's not that you're not good enough. Like life just comes, you know what I yeah. mean? And, and I think they were trying to just protect me from that. And it just ended up really with the instant gratification. Yeah. But you can't, you can't understand that as a kid though. No, nah, uh-uh. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I think we, we all been through that phase, man. It's my, my grandparents were the one that spoiled the hell out of me. For sure. You know, <laughs> like, bro, I was so spoiled, like growing up in Florida, man. And I joke with it about my kids now. Like, man, y'all just don't know how good you got it. Right. right? So I had friends from all walk of life. You know, my grandparents, uh, they were wealthy. I didn't even know it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I just thought going out to the house, we had a lake, horses. I'm uh-huh. riding four wheelers. We on boats, fishing. Are y'all doing it all? Yeah. So I'm thinking, mm. everybody lives this way. Sweet. This yeah. is this is all I know. So I'm going to school. Like, yeah, man. I'm on my four wheeler. We like, yo, what's that? <laughs> you don't have a four wheeler? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, but that's how green I was. Yeah. And then um, I think I my first like eye opening moment was I went to a friend's house. You know, in, in a, the other side of town or whatever. And it was different. You know, Mm -hmm. I didn't visualize it as a kid. You know, I'm just playing. So I didn't like think nothing of it. But he came to my grandparents' house. It was like, yo, this is like the White House, man. And I'm like, (laughs) what? (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, I was like, it's just my grandma's house, dude. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I was just so like beyond uh, like realizing how good I really had it, man. Like, what a brat. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Um, but yeah, man, so it sound like, you know what I'm hearing? You had some feelings, maybe if so, like feeling left out a little bit. Yeah. Even yeah. though you was getting the items, like the, the exterior thing. Yeah, the, the spiritual aspect wasn't yeah. being fed, man, as a, as a child. And just, I don't, by saying, by spiritual, I mean mm-hmm. like the, not the, the the higher power, I'm talking about like the inside, the yeah. feelings, the emotions. I love you, yeah. I'm proud of you. No doubt. Yeah, those things, man. I, Bro, I had a, a, a lot of lack of those too, because that's a lot of why I did some of the things I did. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, well, at what age did you, uh, you know, start to, I guess, re- rekindle? Did you ever get back in touch with moms? And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and moms, she's the one that spoils the grandbabies now. You know, what I mean? <laughs> you no, love how that works, right? <laughs> yeah. So me and moms, like, even though. We, we I, I lived with my aunt for a while and was with them. Like, mm-hmm. I always had a connection with my mom. Like, that's what's up. And it's always been a connection that's been unbreakable. You know what I mean? Nice. Like, it, it's it's always been there. Um, she's always been my ride or die from the day one. You know what I mean? I know she was just busy in her struggles, too. Uh, but never in my mind did I ever doubt that mom didn't want the best for me. Dog, heck yeah, yeah man. As a as a as a child and a youth, understanding that is surely a blessing. Yeah. I was on the flip of that, man. Like I just thought nobody cared about me, and yeah. I, I before this, I just told you how I had everything. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like like you get a certain age, like bro, I sound nuts. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> what was uh, that? Thinking? Yeah, like bro, what was I thinking, man? Where did time go? Yeah. Like I was just riding that four wheeler yesterday, man. <laughs> you know what I'm right. saying? Like it's wow, bro. You know. Um, so, so you go through, I guess, that phase. Uh, where'd you grow up, man? Here, Richmond. So, so I grew up in between Richmond, Virginia, and Knoxville, Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. So um, my mom ended up meeting a guy um, that was building the Cracker Barrel in Mechanicsville, and she he ended up staying at the same apartment complex that my mom was at, and she ended up falling in love with him. He had a house out in Knoxville, Tennessee, and then we also had a house in Richmond, Virginia. So okay. I grew up in Houston. Yeah. Word. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, the boys almost got it done. I know it. Yeah. Yeah. 
But yeah, so I, I, I spent a lot of my life in Richmond and we would visit um, Tennessee. And then later in my life, I moved, moved in a while. And, that, you know, we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, I'm sure as we get further down the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No doubt. Like, but you went to school and everything here? Yeah, I went to school here. Okay. Um, I grew up in Mechanicsville area. Okay. Uh, went to, as it was there in Lee Davis, now Mechanicsville High. And okay. then had some troubles there. Had to get moved to another uh, school in the Hanover area. Okay. Yeah. So that was like high school. Yeah. yeah, that's, yeah that's I had a lot of sense. had a lot of good. I'm um, super athletic, man. I had a lot of uh, chances inside of high school to become really far. Um, mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of scholarships that that came to me for basketball. Really? Uh, yeah. And you know, while I was in high school, my mom developed cancer. You no. Know, my state. He was worked on the road a lot. Um, this is one part of my story where like I started growing up a lot quicker than I needed to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she was kind of staying in, in her car during times of like when she had her chemo and she couldn't drive all the way home. She would get sick. I found out she was doing that and kind of stopped going to school to take care of her. Mm-hmm. And it was also an excuse to do what I wanted to do because I didn't want to do what, you know, teachers and everything yeah. else wanted to do. Yeah. So it was like taking advantage of the situation a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. So when, like, man, let's go back then. As we jump right to high school, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> through middle school, how how was that? Like you were still... Yeah, yeah, I was... So I started off young in my experience, right? Um I had, like I said, I had an older brother. He was four years older than me. So when I was going into fifth, uh, fifth grade and going into middle school, he was already with the mess. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I was, I was, <laughs> just I was watching it. Yeah, I was just watching <laughs> it and like, can't wait to put me in the game. You know what I mean? Put me in the yeah, game. Put coach. me in the game. I just, you know, and as a kid, you just want to be like, yeah, he was friendly with a lot of the kids in the neighborhood. Uh, I'm not going to say we had a bad neighborhood, but mm-hmm. we just, we just, all those kids weren't bad kids. We just ran them up. Yeah, yeah ran them up, you know, just like any other kids. Out yeah, there. bro. It is. It's, it's, it's what you do, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think as you grow, you get around like a certain youth and like one person got an idea and we all with it. But it's <laughs> a kid that kind of like has the proper mindset, like, no, nah, you know, I'm going to go home. Yeah. And everybody else, nah, you square. You know what I'm saying? We're going to go do it anyway. So I got you, bro. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> It, you know, we we had fun in, in middle school, man. I was already, you know, dibbling and dabbling um, because, like I said, I had an older brother and older cousin that I, I, I idolized. You know, that's the one that got me. My cousin's the one that got me into basketball, uh, sports in general. It was just super athletic. And like I said, I lived with my aunt for a while. So this was like my, my shining star. You know what I mean? Word. And I just... Wanted to be just like him. And that, okay. that's, you know, he liked the Raiders. I'm a huge Oakland Raider. <laughs> you know, Las that's Vegas how Raiders. Trickle down, yeah, yo. it just keeps going. So, you know, I was very, uh, in a sense, uh, impressed with everything that he did. And I wanted to be, uh, you know, an imprint of what he left in the world to others as like he did me. That's what's sense. up, man. Yeah. So, all right. So you're watching your cousin. You start balling. Did you start at Hanover Youth? Basketball yeah, league? so I started at Hanover Rec Center, man. Okay. Rec League, um, started playing basketball for them. Had a, had a lot of friends, man. C- continued to keep playing. Um, my coach told my family, hey, look, man, like, this kid's good. Like You should definitely get him oriented with some school sports. Mm-hmm. Uh, ended up playing one year in, in Hanover Middle School. And then uh, it, it transitioned into to high school, continued to play. Uh, thank God for the coaches I had that put – little bit of wisdom up in me uh, uh-huh. to keep me at somewhat, you know, uh, grounded. Right. And right. then, uh, you know, unfortunately, I, as it continued to go, like my troubles just started getting deeper and deeper. And, I got you. Yeah. So when did like, I want to say the trouble aspect, but when, when did the unsettling, I guess, of like your core start to come in to play? You know, if you're playing ball, you got, Sound like you had a positive role model in your cousin who was playing sports. Mm-hmm. So you watch him, then you got the older brother that's like, nah, like I want to be like that. You know what this kind of sounds like? You ever seen American Gangster? Oh yeah. <laughs> Remember uh TI TI was in the joint. He had the small part. Yeah. And Frank Lucas was like, nah, man, you a baseball star. Yeah. Like, yo, you go play baseball. And he's like, nah, I want to be like you, Uncle Frank. Right. And I'm watching the TV, like, yo, you dummy. <laughs> like, yo. <laughs> you got it all. Yeah, you ready, you ready to go. 
pro in baseball. Yeah, you want right. to be like Uncle Frank. Yeah. <laughs> it, it be like that sometimes. Man. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah. I think I think all of us had the one. We like, nah, man, I, that looks great. Yeah. But all of this ruckus you got going on over here looks a lot better. Yeah. And you know what? I, t- I tell people that all the time, man. I call that the ripple effect, right? Mm-hmm. Because we have so much going for us in our lives, and like we don't realize how much we do to other folks that aren't even really in our lives. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like me going up and, and coughing on the corner, right? What about them kids that are waiting on the on the school bus, waiting to pick up? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And their family out there struggling. Like they could just, in their mind, they're looking at it like, man, forget this. I can just do this and I ain't got to worry about it. my family's going to be all right. Like yeah. I feel bad for some of the things I've done and now that I look back. I mean, we make our amends, bro. Yeah. I, and I think that's why they say hindsight is twenty twenty. Yeah. You know, because I, I definitely, you know, stuff that I'm not proud of, um, played the part of <laughs> seeing, you know, people go down that uh, long road. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, with social media and everything, it was difficult as I was going towards recovery, yeah. watching them decline. Yeah. You know, and it's like, damn, like, I know I'm not the main reason, yeah, but I feel, yeah, mm-hmm. horrible that I even put them in this position. Absolutely. You know, and then I, like, I, I reached out to a few of them, like, hey, you know, I'm here to help, like, you know, yeah. apologize. And most of the time, you know, most people is like, nah, like, I don't even remember. Yeah. You know, but in my head, yeah. it was like, damn, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No doubt. So what age do you think, man, it, uh, it started to go down that road for you, bro? Man, it, it, I ain't going to lie to you. It started early for me. First time I ever really dibbled and dabbled in hard drugs, I was 14 years old. By the time I was 16, I remember getting out of my mom's car from dropping me off, and I had a chip on my shoulder. Really? And, yeah, and like I, I was doing all this while keeping this facade of like this – I ain't gonna say good kid, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? But but this kid that had things going for him. Word. Like and it it was hard, man. It it was it was hard to play that part. And it it just spiraled even more out of control at 17 and 18. And it, that's like really when my my story started. Mm-hmm. Um my story has dealt with like mass incarceration a lot. Okay. Um I have I have struggled with the criminal justice system a lot. Thank God I'm not nowadays. Amen, Um, bro. I just want to go ahead and tell this podcast. I've been on probation and parole since I was 13 years old in the state of Virginia. I am now off of all papers as of January 6th. Yo, (laughs) hold on, man. Let me get you the... uh, Listen, bro. Salute, good sir. So, yeah, you you did start young. Yeah. From 13. Yeah. Well... Take me back to 13, bro. What was the first kind of instance that put you in that position? Oh, uh, man. If, so, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, no, I don't mind man. at all. So, like I said, I wanted to be just my cousin. I didn't want it to be just like my brother. Um, I remember my brother, and I was still, I was drinking and, and smoking weed at this time, right? Mm-hmm. But then, like, my brother got me in the car and took me on a ride with him and told me we were going to a party. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't really like getting the war stories, but we ended up into... Uh, this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I kind of went back into like sitting on the couch with this random person. And I was wondering like, why are we here? What are we doing? Mm -hmm. And and I ended up going around the wall and look and see my brother and his friend doing something. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, what y'all doing? And you know, back then you're like, what are you crackhead? This and I I feel bad. He's like, come here, come here, come here. This is diesel. And I was like, well, I don't know what that is. And, like, it's my brother, so I uh-huh. trust him. You know what I mean? Right, I'm like, right. surely he wouldn't do anything like this. And sure enough, man, I had um, heroin that night at the age of 13. Mm-hmm. And when he looked at me, he said, man, you just did heroin, man. You can't tell mom. Damn, And, like, bro. I remember my stomach sinking, like, what have I done? You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. But the, the flip side of that is I can remember the feeling it gave me. Mm-hmm. And it was like no other feeling that I ever had in the world. And it scared me. And I remember feeling that feeling. Mm. You know what I mean? That was 13. 13. How old are you now? I am 37. Good God, bro. Yeah. That's 14 years. Mm. And you still remember yeah. at that one. Absolutely. Like it, like it. When I t- when I tell you I fell in love with that feeling so mm-hmm. bad, it took not only me and my soul for so long, mm-hmm. but it took my like my family and everything away from me mm. to chase that. 
All right. Mm-hmm. So so you get the first joint 13, you still hooping, mm-hmm. trying to carry on a normal life. And you probably don't even realize like you're addicted at this point. So like at that point, it won't like no everyday thing. Mm-hmm. As time went on and I got into high school, uh, like I still I didn't have like one group of people. I was friendly with every and I could talk to anybody and everybody. Word. Right. And um, I just continued to go at 16 is when I really remember feeling what I was feeling and knowing what was going on. And I kind of got away from it a little bit Mm -hmm. um, and put myself back into sports a lot. And then at the age of 17, it was just run amok. Like it it was pretty much over. Like I said, my mom got the cancer. Mm -hmm. I had kind of like a leeway of a lot of things I could do because she was handling so much. Right. You know, I was kind of left to my own devices. Yeah. So uh, I can remember that. I actually ended up dropping out of high school to take care of her, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And ended up starting getting with a couple of guys that were up to no good. Yeah. (laughs) And and, yeah, and uh, ended up going and doing. uh, uh, Living with your auntie. I was wondering. My bad, bro. (laughs) I was wondering if he was going to catch that. Oh, man. That's what's up. Yeah. But, um, so, yeah, I ended up committing some crimes with them, man. It come back two weeks after I turned 18. Detectives mm. came. Um, and that's when, like, the mass incarceration uh, plot started. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if any to deal with Hanover County. I love them now. I didn't love them then because I wasn't doing the right things right. But, like, Word. they they put me they put me in a bad spot to start, you know, my my. Adult, adult life. life, you know, and they thought that that was going to correct it. Mm-hmm. And there was no correction. And, you know, mm-hmm. uh, no kind of redemption and reconstruction in one's life. Uh, but they, they, they pushed me down the road. Uh, and I learned one thing. And that was, that was pretty much survival. work ethic. Sur- oh. Survival and work ethic. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, you got to put in work and, and you got to be the best at it. If you're not, man, like you, you're going to be in a lot of trouble in this world, especially right. back there, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So I, I learned those things and it just continued, man. Like I didn't get the help I needed. So there was no way for me to better myself inside means that kept bringing me back there, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah, no doubt, bro. So mm-hmm. you went in, how long was the first bit? So the first one was from age of 18 to almost 22. Um, so I did a little under four years, uh, probably like three. Bro, that's so crazy. As, yeah. as a, like how at 18, man, we'll get down there. Yeah. It just it just baffles me, man, like some of the, the court decisions. You know what I'm yeah, saying? How those, how those things come down to play. Yeah. But yet they'll send you to war. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Man, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was the first one. Um, yeah. So you come home, you get no type of uh, rehabilitation. Yeah. It didn't rehabilitate you at all. Gladiator school, you surviving, you learning work ethic, you come mm-hmm. back home to the street to the same thing. Well, so I, I came back <laughs> home to the same thing, not necessarily right back into the mix, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm thinking that I'm fixed, right? But mm-hmm. I ain't got no problem no more, right? right. Like, that's what my brain tells me because right. I ain't been educated in the disease of addiction and what it can yeah, do. We, right? we don't know. We just yeah. go hey. through life. Yeah. So um, I go home. I get with my brother and them. Of course, they're still drinking and having fun, doing their things because they ain't as wild as me when I pick up, right? Right. So it <laughs> takes me a, a couple months to be back in the mix. Mm-hmm. Um and and within a, a year, I'm I'm back in a, another Richmond City jail mm. for for so that one I did I think two two to three years close to three years inside of the Richmond City, and then and that's when like the the Knoxville Tennessee thing really came into play right because like it ain't. Problem, right? Right. Yeah, yeah trying now, to move. Yeah, yeah, I ain't the problem, but this place is the problem. And and so I ended up moving to Knoxville thinking that would be like the end all be all solution. Mm-hmm. Only to fool myself that no matter where I moved, I took me with me, which yeah. is a problem. Man, that that is uh <clears throat> the biggest uh, I think facade and lie we all tell ourselves. All right. Cause I you know, I did 
one one bid. I did a year mm-hmm. in Rico East. Though. I, mean, I don't know which one is which, but the one I'll pair them. Then I went out to the program. Yeah, out of New Kent. Mm-hmm. And when I talk stuff to get better. Yeah. But all I heard was one of my homeboys is on two seventeen. And that's that. He was like, man, I go now he's in two nineteen. But if you go to the program, you get time off your sentence. Yeah, that's a team team. That's all I heard. I was yeah. like, all right, bet. Like where I say, man, tell him. So I go, and I'm doing the groups every day. I'm speaking. I'm doing uh. the step work, bro. I'm listening <laughs> to the speakers. No doubt. And all I'm thinking, yo, I'm going home. Oh, that's three days. Oh, that's six days. That's nine. <laughs> nine nine. Days, yeah, I knocked half a month off. All, you know what yeah. I'm saying? That's all I was thinking about. So I literally came home. And that night, I think they had a welcome home party. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it was right back. I never, thank God, like I never really got in no major trouble after that. Just mm-hmm. a couple one-nighters here yeah. and there. You know what I'm saying? Being drunk in public. Yeah, pretty much that was it, right? Drunk in public. They picked me up, yeah. sleep it off. Going back. Yeah, and I'm going. Like, mm. oh, shit, man. Yeah, I got a good-ass nap. You know, I'm yeah. playing with it, thinking this shit is funny. Yeah. Not really understanding, like, hey, bro, you running out of chances. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Them people already told you. You come back in here before, but what I did the first time, bro, there's no slap on the wrist. Like, hey, we're going to yeah. give you a chance to scoop, bro. You going up the road yeah. to Kentucky <laughs> somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Not That never registered with me. So, uh, so yeah, then in 2010... It was this, man. You know, I can't do shit here. I'm getting up out of Richmond. Yeah. I'm going to go back to Florida. Man, I, I was probably down there for a good week. Yeah. And then I found myself in the bar at a couple of homes. Man, good people, too. Like, I still rock with some of these people to this day, like, talk yeah. to them. It was me. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. whatever y'all with, I'm with. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I found myself, bro. I lasted maybe six months down there. And then I came back because I realized, like, Florida is a completely different <laughs> animal. Yo, I was oh, yeah. like, yo, I'm going to die or I'm never going to make it out of here. And I had I had my first son at the time, too. He was like six months old. Yeah, that's you know what I'm saying? Right so my whole plan, because this thing was like, yo, I'm going to move to Florida. I'm going to get my life together. I'm going to move my family here. I'm going to work. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That was my plan. Mm-hmm. You know, but addiction was like, no. <laughs> like that, yeah. that ain't going to fly, bro. Um, no, so, I'm still with you. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So you go to Tennessee, bro. Like, what What does that kind of look like for so you? So that looked like that I was on it. So this is my stop fronting uh, part of it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, this is me trying to act like I done got everything figured out. And, like, I, I'm I'm good. And I did good for, like, six, seven months. And then I found myself so empty inside. Like, I awesome job. I was making bank. I was running heavy equipment. I had been doing construction work almost all my life because Mm -hmm. my stepdad taught me 90% of what to do on the job site. And once again, I told you that the only thing, one of the only things I worked on side of my incarceration was my work ethic. Right. So I could pretty much outwork anybody on the job site. So I'm making, you know, everything that I need. And that's when I found like money in this can't buy you happiness. Mm -hmm. Right. And like I started coming home to no friends still because I was scared that friends Yeah. Right? You know what I mean? Friends is the problem. Yeah. So then I would come home, I would sit there and I'd just be miserable, man. Like mm-hmm. white knuckling it, just don't do nothing. And I remember going out one night and I went to a, a downtown bar and I was so sick of being lonely, right? And my kids had, had beat me at that point and was like, all right, well, this is the only thing we know how to do, and this is the only way we know how to enjoy life. So yeah. this is what we're going to do. And I remember going to a rooftop bar, and the lady came to me when my tab got to, like, $1,400. God damn. And she was, and, and I was on the rooftop buying everybody drinks because I needed to be everybody's friend yeah, because, like, you know. clearly this ain't the problem no more, you know. And I'm out there being social just like I always am and how I am now without all the stimulants, right? Uh-huh. But, like... I remember her coming to me and saying that and me looking at her like she's crazy. Like, what are you, what are you, what are you trying to tell me? Yeah. You know? And she was like, well, you have to pay this. And I was like, well, that's fine, but we got to keep this going. <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> Yo, pay that shit and keep moving. <laughs> keep, it, keep it going. Like, we're having a blast out here. And I'm thinking, like, this is the best thing that's ever happened because I haven't experienced good things in my life, like Mm -hmm. good connections with good people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. At this point in my life. And I remember 
like now I look back and I'm like, gosh, I had to be the silliest goofball up in the plan. They probably <laughs> make it dumb. <laughs> yeah, dumb ass buying everybody drinks. But uh, you we know, all been there, bro. Yeah. So like I, I, I learned at this point in my life, man, that like I had to be comfortable in my own skin, right? Like mm-hmm. looking back when hindsight 2020, I can see that me not being comfortable in my own skin and willing to be the person that I am every day now. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I yeah. was worried about what other people wanted and wanted them to like me. And I was fronting everybody. So they never got this like genuine, authentic Kenny. They mm-hmm. got to do the mask, that, the mask yeah, that yeah, we wear. bro. Yeah, mm. that, that mask would it get you in a lot of rooms, man, with a lot of fake love. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And they'll yeah. punish you every time. Every single time, bro. Because mm. that mask and that all that fake love come with a lot of wear and tear that you don't necessarily feel till later on when you got to look in the mirror yeah. and, and peel it, that joint off. And, and like, don't get me wrong, my first mm-hmm. wife was, and, and I met her in Tennessee, right? <clears throat> But I didn't want to get married. And, and my addiction strung me to the point of like, I was scared to tell her. Fear rid my life of everything good, including myself. Mm-hmm. And I remember during this addiction time in Tennessee, like I had met this girl and I and she was she was a, a wonderful human being, but mm-hmm. like it just wasn't meant for us to be married. Right. But somehow my addiction made it so I couldn't even speak up and say, no, like this ain't no good idea. You just um, rolled roll with, roll with it. Yeah. yeah. And um, needless to say, I got in trouble out there once again. And, and this is like where I did a lot of time um, and, and ended up doing it out there. And like some of the biggest moments in my life that made the person that you're talking to right now, mm. like come out and realize like, like you were saying, it, it ain't no more games. You know right. what I mean? Like it's, it's make or break at this point. And I was playing with it in the criminal justice system. Taught me at this point, you ain't going to win this game. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I think, bro, so my eye opening moment, it, it came my my middle son. He now 10. He was a month old. So right before my U-turn moment, man, mm-hmm. like I was at my breaking point. Mm-hmm. Right. <clears throat> and I, like I told this a couple of times. But, you know, I, I, I was so self-defeated, man, by like life, uh, you know, like the shit people would say. Like I was just so broken down internally mm. um, that I couldn't see a way out. Yeah. And all I knew was get product, sell product, right. get money. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And that was it. So I hit my stick, man. And shout out my dog. Last yeah. seen him another day and we was rapping about it, like laughing. You know what I'm saying? So we can laugh at these <laughs> yeah, things now. absolutely. I hit my dog. And, he, you know, he helped me out and I'm sitting there looking at it mm-hmm. through a little bit. So my drug of choice was cocaine. Yeah. You know, and uh, I had this this, this female meet me mm-hmm. and I was like, well, because my addiction idea, like, if I don't sell it. Yeah, you, somebody going. Yeah, you go move it. You mm-hmm. bring me the money back. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what I'm saying? We'll I'm not using back. that. Definitely. Yeah, <laughs> you feel me? Like, I concocted a plan. Yeah. But what happened, bro, like, I think... I got high and got scared, mm-hmm. like terrified, like, oh shit, they already told me because I was still on probation. And I was like, you know, they already told me if I get in trouble again, it's nine years. Like, I got two kids now. I'm doing the math, like, high, like, <laughs> they're going to be out of high. Yeah, school. bro. I'm like, I'm going through, like, oh shit, I cannot do this. And then it was like, Facts. man, what if she gets in trouble and then rats on me? And yeah. then I'm a, I'm distributing nigga, bro. Like, <laughs> I'm sitting there, like, oh fuck, I, man, yeah. I got high in a panic. <laughs> <laughs> so yo, thank thank God, man. I hit my man's, uh, gave it back <laughs> a little short, throwing some money. Like, hey, bro, my bad, <laughs> bad decisions. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. But that that's like my ace. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I thank God, like I moved away from it. But then a month later, uh, you know, I, I reached my breaking point, and I tried to take myself out. Mm-hmm. You know, because I still couldn't figure it out. Oh. I was just like, like, fuck, I can't do that because I don't want to go to prison. I don't want to do that. I was 27. Yeah. So that would have been like 37. Kind of like, man, I'm not doing that shit. Like, the only other way I know is to leave yeah. Earth. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> trying to try do that. Word. <laughs> you know, so I tried that. Mm-hmm. Thank God I'm still here. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So you you hit Tennessee, get in some other trouble. How long did you serve this time? So I got a 10-year sentence at 35%. I got... So I got denied parole twice until they let me out. I actually ended up spending close to 
a little over six years inside of the Tennessee State Prison. God dang. Yeah, and it's, it's nothing like the state of Virginia. It was a complete war zone. Really? Um, yeah. So I actually, um, where I, one of the places I ended up to, and this was like one of the most mind-blowing things, it was actually the place that, that broke me down and, and built me up just to the point, not saying that I fixed my life at that point, but mm-hmm. like it gave me a foundation to build on. Um, I met an individual. They made us do a bunch of groups. I'm an individual counselor that like really took time and, and seen something in me that I didn't see in myself mm-hmm. that my family had also seen in me and tried to build up. And like, congrats to her, man, because like I still thank God for her every day. Uh, but she she just poured a lot of lot of stuff into me and and, and always gave me knowledge and always called me on my mm-hmm. bullshit because I was I was the best bullshitter. In of the course, world. <laughs> yeah. I could I could <laughs> smile and go on and get anything I needed, right? But like so. Uh, she she did a lot of parts, but then one of the main parts is I was at Riverbend Maximum Security, uh, and that's in the um, city of Nashville, and they had not executed an inmate for over nine years. Mm-hmm. And like I'm on the part where they pretty much got to walk the dude past our windows, and I remember they locked this down, right? And I heard the chains and everything coming through, and like I couldn't see them, but I could hear it, right? And mm-hmm. they had locked this down. And I'm looking there and I'm like, man, I'm like playing a game with this this whole group in my life, right? And like these people don't care. Mm-hmm. Like they'll literally walk you to a chair, strap you to it, and kill it. And don't yeah. get me wrong, I'm not doing anything harmful to people. Mm-hmm. My everything that took me to prison was to feed my addiction, right? Mm-hmm. And like it still don't matter. It's putting me in places where they're strapping people to the chairs and killing them, can it? Right. Like, what is you doing? You can't win. There is no win in this, man. Like, this is, you better than this. You can do better than this. You want better than this. And, like, I remember, man, being broke down at that moment and, like, yeah, forget this. Man. Like, there's got to be a better way. Like, mm. Let's start fixing it. You know what I mean? And, and, and thank God, like, I met the people, like, the, the counselor I was telling you about and a couple other individuals that worked inside of the, the Tennessee Department of Corrections and also some <coughs> of the guys that I served a lot of time with, like, I built a bond and, and I started and I'll tell you one of my biggest struggles for anybody who has struggled with like doing some time at home, like that camaraderie, right? That you mm-hmm. find inside of there. Well, that meant like the world to me because I play sports, right? Mm-hmm. And like the camaraderie that you get inside of the locker rooms and get inside of the ball games, yeah. right? Like oh yeah. The, oh, yeah. yeah. That mission is just to win the next game, mm-hmm. prepare and win the next game. Well, I found it inside of the institutions and jails, right? It's mm-hmm. like we just got to make it to this release date. You know right, what I mean? Like, right. We just got to make it to this release date, right? And then I come home and there's no camaraderie because mm-hmm. people are so busy out of their life and inside of doing their own things. And I get that, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But like to an individual that's coming home and, and don't know and don't have a life really, like mm-hmm. you get lost and, and you start thinking, man, I'm inadequate. I'm not enough. I can't mm-hmm. do these things. I don't know how I'm going to do it. And I remember one time, like, all my friends are living this highlight reel on Facebook. And now mm-hmm. that I know it's a highlight reel. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah, like, that, like the that. highlight reel. Yeah. yeah. But like I see them and I and I remember thinking like there's no light at the end of the tunnel, man. Like it don't matter how hard I work, like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Like mm-hmm. what can I do? Right. And and that defeat, man, was mm-hmm. like utterly hard, bro. Like I I can't even explain it in words. Like Coming from that into where I am now is mm. unbelievable. You know what I mean? Like, mm. it feels so good. Amen, but what I was bro. getting at was, like, the camaraderie that I had inside of those, I found it inside of recovery. Right? Amen. I found it inside of the people that are just striving to do the next right thing today. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's just find out how we're supposed to get through today without <laughs> messing our life up. <laughs> and, and, like, I found it, man. And I'm... It's the joy, like simply coming over you, man, speaking about that moment and finding yourself, bro, uh, and filling that void, man. So that's what it took. You was laying in the bunk, listening to the chains clink. Mm-hmm. And that was that the start of the U turn moment, or was that like, yo, this is it? Yeah, no, that was like this. So that was like the main part that started making me do the turn. That was mm-hmm. the event that happened to that. So I got locked up in Richmond, Virginia, from Tennessee, mm-hmm. and they they ex they extradited me back 
the bondsman went and took me. And the night that I was getting arrested, I was I was homeless in New York, to tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. I came down, took a bus down to, to Richmond to meet my wife at the time that I told you about in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Um, her birthday was September 19th. It was September 18th. I remember that I came home to Richmond to wait for her. And when I was walking around, this young boy, right? So these two played correlating in between. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was so sick from being on the bus ride all the way back and coming home and like needing to, you know, get mine, get mine. I remember this young VCU student coming down the road. And I don't know if y'all remember in old Richmond when they saw me at Cookies was down there. He used to have the steps, right? Mm-hmm. And he was so inebriated, man, that he fell down the steps. And anybody that knows me, like, I'm one person to help, right? Mm-hmm. And, like, it was a eye-opening moment for me as I look back. And at that moment, right, that other moment that I was talking about, like, I just walked past this dude and was like, yeah, forget it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, he got his own troubles. I got my troubles. Let me go and figure out mine. Mm-hmm. And, and that was totally not me because I always wanted to be somebody to help in somebody right. else's life. So I walked on past him. Later that night, I ended up on the, the Daily Planet steps, and I was homeless, I was miserable, and I was sitting there smoking my last cigarette, and I'm talking to God at the same time, it's pouring down, raining, and I'm looking, it's like two o'clock in the morning, I'm looking in the window, looking at myself, just looking terrible, smoking a cigarette, and I'm like, God, I, I deserve better than this, I'm better than this. If I gotta sleep outside one more night, right? Like, I'm just going to jump off the Lee Street Bridge. Mm. I, I just can't do it no more, man. Like, my family deserves better. Like, I can't keep putting the people I love through this stuff. And I'm sorry I keep hitting at that. Nah, you good, um, bro. But so then, as I'm saying this, the same kid that, that walked, I walk past, walks past me, and I see him. And I'm like, damn, he making it home. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, in the midst of it, like, in the side of my brain. And he gets probably, like... 20 yards out and he turns around and it's like this kid has never had a drink in his life. And there's seven other people on the daily planet steps Mm -hmm. and he walks dead up to me and his exact words, man. And I won't cry right now saying it because I know. Let it go, bro. Let it go. Let it go. He looked at me and he said, man, I know you don't want to sleep outside, man. Like my roommates had gone to Florida for the weekend. I got a bed. You can crash in for the night. And like at that moment, I didn't know what the fuck just happened. Mm -hmm. Like, I had no fucking clue. All I cared about was not having to sleep outside because it's cold and raining. But like as my my incarceration bit came on, I was soul searching and I was searching for a connection with my higher power. And I started seeing at those moments, right, like when I didn't deserve mercy, mercy Mm. was still given to me. Like I didn't deserve nothing. But to sleep Damn, on Kenny, that, come on, bro. Yeah, I didn't deserve anything but to sleep on them steps and, and, and wallow in my own mud. But they seem fit, man, to come back and save me. And, like, to tell you this day, I, if you put that kid in front of me, I wouldn't even know what he looked like, man. I don't even know if the individual was real. <laughs> like, it, it, it was such an a outstanding moment in my life for me to realize, man, like, I don't always have to be deserving, man, to be redeemed. I don't need to be deserving to have grace. I just need to know when grace is shed upon me. Amen, bro. Yeah. And, and continue to give it back. Yeah, you absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Right. That, that was that was utterly powerful and moving. So I think everybody that's been in positions of like, you know, God, this is it. <laughs> like, I, I'm done. done. And then it's like, not yet. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Like, uh, like, wait a minute, yo. Like, yeah, what's this <laughs> yeah, wait, yo, hold on, bro. Like, yeah. what, what's what's going on here, man? Um, yeah, bro. That that was moving, man. So. That instant leads, you do the incarceration bid, right. you know what I'm saying? You come home. How do you start that process? Man, so I started really good. I came home to an RCO. I was doing really good things. I got straight back in the, to, to working. Um, at that time, I was doing construction. I was doing electrical work, uh, yada, yada, yada. And, like, so that won't the end of, like, this how we ended up here, yeah, right? You're good, you're good, yeah, you're good. So I spent six months in the RCO and did fine, right? Mm-hmm. And I had built this little connection, a little network, but I had done it on this facade of like, I'm going to be all right this time. And mm-hmm. like, so I, I, went, I moved out and went back home 
and was like, all right, I'm just going to stay here for a couple months and I'm going to get my own place again. Like, we're going to be good. I don't have to worry about it. Not knowing that, like, all my demons were still inside of me from that place. You know what I mean? Wait. Like, yeah, waiting to jump back in. So, you know, I, I, I walked back into the house with every good intention there was, but I wasn't prepared for what I needed to do. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I hadn't I built that network that I needed. And I went home. The network was a facade because I was trying to be somebody that I'm not going to say I was trying to be. I was the person that I was trying to be, but I wasn't being 100 percent. You didn't do all the internal work. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, so. I ended up going back out to the to the bars again, thinking that it was going to be OK because life started to show up in life the way it does. And I ended up. uh you know, a, a year later, uh, I had, so at that point, right, when I came home, I had close to five years clean. Mm. I lost all that and went back out there for a little over a year. And the end of it, and this is where I, I, I really kind of want to focus on, I took you, so you've been, you had to deal with him, right, go. I mm-hmm. took him, right, going a three and a half mile foot chase. Right? And it wasn't because. <clears throat> I was scared to go to jail. I knew I was going to jail. I'd have mm-hmm. been to jail 10 million times in my life. It felt like mm-hmm. I knew I was going to jail. Like only reason I continued to run was because I needed one more. Right? Yeah. Like if I can just get there one more, mm-hmm. everything's going to be I'll all go, right. Yeah, I'll go. I'll go. Yeah. But just let me run from y'all. And I remember like, so at the end of it, whatever happened, it kind of beat me. I probably deserved it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I remember sitting in there, this time, this is like when the complete U-turn started. And I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, I am completely done. And I started praying for all these things that I have now because I started believing, man, you believe what you, you live what you believe, right? And if I don't start <laughs> believing in something, I'll fall for anything. anything. You know what I mean? Hell like, So yeah. it's time to start putting these things into action. And like, so they got me. I went to him right go and then had to go into uh, Hanover again for another violation. Uh, I had 18 years over my head in the, in the county of Hanover. I had no time in the in the county of um, Hemrico. So they switched me over there. And I remember, man, getting on the phone, calling these people like, man, I got to figure this thing out. Like, my life don't end here. Mm-hmm. Like, my addiction cannot beat me, man. I need one more chance. Just one more chance, guy. I remember praying every <laughs> night. Just give me one more chance. I can do it, man. And like he didn't give it to me right away. Mm-hmm. I had to sit in there and fight for it and fight for so it. Some guy's time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was like yes, no, or grow, right? Mm-hmm. And his answer was grow. And let me see if you're for real about this. And like so, I just continued to keep going. Pass the test. Man. Pass, Pass the, test. the test, bro. Yeah. So I ended up going back in front of the, the judge again, and like I think you know, I don't, I don't know if anybody here is a, a spiritual believer, but I know when. Hey, right in, here, man. Yeah. Talk to me. Talk to me. I know in the book, man, it speaks about a parable of an individual knocking on the door, right? If they don't knock on the door because, it, I mean, if they don't answer the door because they they genuinely want to answer the door, mm-hmm. if you keep knocking, they'll just answer it because you're persistent. You right. know what I mean? Right. And, like, I became belief in that. Like, I'm not going to give up because if I give up, that means I don't want it. And they're going to see that I don't want it. So I'm going to go in and fight in every battle I could. And I remember it's the same judge that sent me away the last time. And he was like, you know what? I'm going to give you a chance to go to this because I put in to go to a program, right? And ended up getting into the program. The judge was like, you know what? You're so persistent. We're going to give you a chance. And he had every intention to throw me away, right? Mm-hmm. Like he had been tired of seeing me. He'd been seeing me since a kid. And he was like, I'm going to give you a chance to get it right this time. But if I hear you fart the wrong way, I'm, you coming back. He meant that shit yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah, he meant it, right? And I was like, yeah, okay. I can't oh, do this. Shit. So, man, like, the struggle really started here, right? Like, I had a girlfriend that I had hurt that I'm mm-hmm. still with today. Thank God that she's here, man. Like, she's definitely a huge part of my life that that she showed me what abandonment doesn't, you know, like mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be abandonment when somebody goes through hard times. Like you can stick with them and you can become better for y'all throughout it. Right. So I got that individual in my life that God blessed me with. And like we start going and two months into this, this, this bond, like we made our first baby Liam. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, I was like, holy shit, like I've done messed up already. The judge gonna get into this and really like you ain't doing no recovery. You out here making, making babies. Baby. <laughs> and I'm like, man, what should I do, man? So <laughs> so I was like, oh my goodness. And the only thing I could think of at the time, man, like, so I had been praying for these moments. Like, God, just 
I love kids to death, man. Like the best thing that ever happened to me are my kids, mm-hmm. right? And like he's blessed me with another one. Uh, his father is is a result of an overdose, man. He passed away, and like I get mm-hmm. to be a dad to this kid. Really amazing to see this kid grow and, and to look at me, you know, as a role model figure, man. Uh, considering what his dad had been through and what I had been through, right? Amen. Uh, so, needless to say, I, I'm I'm sitting here talking to her. I'm like. Hey, we we about to have a baby. She's like, yeah. I was like, we need some protection, right? Like, and I'm a I'm a firm believer that names hold power, right? right? So his name is Liam because it means protector. And like that kid's been every bit of protection in my life. I heard you talk about your kids, man. You seem to love your kids and know what Bro, the, the feeling, world only knew, man. Yeah, like the feeling of what like. Being a father is something that I pray for daily because I knew I would be such a good one. Just nobody would give me the chance to, to have my kids. And, like, I got this chance, man, and now I have this wonderful family for my recovery. And, like, these kids have 10 million uncles and aunts because I grew up in recovery, right? He, like, grows up and, like, everybody loves this little dude. And, like, he's a, a blessing. And I'm like, thank God, man, that he's not only that for me, but, like, he gets to do this for so many people that miss their kids as well. You know what I mean? Word, bro. Yeah. Man, this was uh, unexpected and utterly powerful, bro. Right. Uh, I'm going to say I'm proud of you. I'm, man, yeah. appreciate it. You most certainly moved me. I'm good. Um, anything I can do to help him hesitate to ask. Absolutely. Um, I appreciate it, man. This is this oh, has been absolutely a blessing for me. Man. Nah, man, that that was spiritual. That was moving. That was uh, emotional. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> I got a lot of them in this. Hey, story. bro, not many times <laughs> on this thing we we've seen two men crying. <laughs> First time for everything. Hey, bro, bro listen, man. Yeah. But that's that's real. That's yeah. authentic. That's transparency, man. Because yeah. I remember growing up and, and tears being like a sign of weakness. You know, my yeah. pops got rested so I lost my pops last year. You know, his thing was, yo, I'm gonna give you something to cry about. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. So you had to <laughs> yeah. suck the Buck joints up. out real quick, like, yes, sir. Yeah, <laughs> you know right. what I'm saying? So now, bro, like when I feel things, that was my addiction. I didn't want to feel. So now when I feel and let it you go. say stuff, bro, and I could see like the imagery in my mind of what you were going through and like relating it to my own life. And it's like, bro, like powerful, oh powerful. So before we wrap up, man, like what could you say uh, to the young man, young woman that is in that space, bro, all hope lost. They sitting outside on the steps, rain and cold and, you know, don't know where to turn. And they just uh-huh. looking for that one, that one Whatever it is, man, yeah. to give them the relief and like a sign of like, holy shit, it's possible. Man, I, I want them to know, first of all, man, that they're absolutely worth it. If they think there's people out there that don't love them, I genuinely love them. I care about them. I want them to feel what it feels like to, to feel the joy in life. Uh, I, I tell them to hold on, you know, hold on, pain ends. Hope is there, man. It is possible. No matter what your mind is telling you, no matter what you are thinking, you are believing. Remember, we live what we believe, right? That you have to believe that you are good enough for the things that you want in life and that you can put the work into it to get it done. And if they ever, man, ever is something that I can do to like help. I, I, I am an individual. Like I said, my goal is to help people. My goal is to put big business out of business. <laughs> All right? Word. Like, yeah, no, I got you. That's what we're working on today, man. Hey, man, I appreciate you pulling up. Yeah. Um, I think I needed to hear that. <laughs> like that that moved me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was just talking to my partner up front doing a real estate thing because he he saw me kind of go through all of my struggles and shit. Yeah. And um and he was like trying to help me out through it all. And I just wasn't ready. So he I went in and said what's up to him before I came back here. And he was like, Man, you holding up all right, because he knew last year I was struggling. Sure. Man. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. my grandma died, and my dad died, and my grandfather died. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I was set down like yeah. heavy Absolutely. last year. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, thank God I remained sober, but I was like stagnant with everything. Yeah. And so today, man, a lot of that. And like, this is probably why I'm crying too, man, because I started getting answers to things that I've been praying for. And it was reminding me of the day that you're talking about. You sit there and you're like, God, like, how much more can I take? take. You feel <laughs> me? It's like, 
bro, give me some. And then the phone ring. Boom. Hey, Jared. Yo. (laughs) (laughs) So, man, I I just want to tell you, bro, I appreciate you pulling up. Absolutely. It's amazing, man. We got to find some way. Uh, to connect and build, man. Absolutely. Because I'm, I'm with you, bro. Like, real spirit. Yeah, absolutely, All right. man. I loved it, man. Nah, this was amazing. Redeem Yourself Podcast. Redeem Yourself Podcast. Redeem Yourself Podcast. Hey, what's going on? This is Jared. Yeah, dog. I appreciate you got something special with him. Just and living the life I was dealt, man. The Redeem Yourself Podcast. I appreciate it, man. I'm glad it was a blessing for you, man.